Thank you. It's a, it's a delight for me to be able to introduce Professor Glendon uh, because for me it's uh, just one more step in a lifetime of a debt to repay to her in terms of what I've learned. But I won't begin introducing her to you uh, by telling you that she's the learned hand professor of law or that she's written uh, the books that she's written on the family and on the state and the award-winning books on the legal profession and the Declaration of Human Rights and so forth, nor by recounting for you the contributions to our intellectual life that she's made in our understandings of democracy, of civil society, and the seedbeds of virtue, the family, the legal profession, and so on. All those things are things that we mostly know, for starters. But more importantly, those aren't the things to me, that define what Professor Mary Ann Glendon really is and gives us. Much more than an author, a contributor to public intellectual life, to scholarly achievement, Professor Glendon is a presence, uh, a presence that is striking in the environments in which she has worked precisely because she represents something new, something different, always. I can illustrate this in a very personal way uh, by recounting my first encounter with her. I, I hate to say it, it was almost 25 years ago when I got to law school. And what I found at law school was an environment extremely polarized, uh, extremely divided. On the one hand, I looked to this side, which happened to be my right, and uh, the world was dominated by a group of economists who primarily seemed to think that what we were about at the law school uh, was nothing more than maximizing efficiency. On this side, which happened to be my left, instead were those who seemed intent on conveying to me that law meant nothing other than a raw exercise of power with no accountability. It was the search for something different that brought me to be struck by the presence of Professor Glendon, someone who represented genuinely a different position, the possibility of newness. Possibility of a newness precisely because what she represented, what she worked for, came from something beyond her. It wasn't just a presentation of her own ideology. And this, for any of us, is something that then attracts curiosity and interest, isn't it? The presence of someone new and interesting and different because it leads us to ask why. Why are you like that? Where does it come from? And that's what I want to be. When I went to ask Professor Glendon, tentatively, where do you fit here? I don't really understand. Um, I, I see this group over here, and I see that group, and, and what about you? And she gave me that very patient, generous, very characteristic smile, slight shrug of the shoulders, and said, well, I think they just regard me as a medievalist. <laughs> And it, and it was perfect, right? Because in the dominant environment of Harvard Law School, to be anything other than conforming to the standard expectations intellectually and ideologically, you might as well have just been a medievalist, meaning to them irrelevant. Uh, and yet, not at all irrelevant, of course, uh, and in an ironic way, perhaps precisely because of being at least metaphorically, a medievalist. Someone who, like the medieval mind would have done, saw all the world as a sign, all of reality, as something to be intensely interested in and engaged with. The openness of her reason was what struck me, the breadth of an interest in all that surrounded her. And there, at last, was the real reason for someone and something who was a different kind of presence in that environment. That breadth and openness of reason, of course, uh, in anyone, entails a certain amount of risk. And that also has been characteristic of Marianne Glendon's work and her person. Uh, one 
is brought to recognize that to truly be free and to be interested in testing all things and retaining what is good brings one into sometimes uncomfortable kinds of relationships and questions and inquiries uh, and takes a great deal of courage, all the more for someone who, as she's demonstrated in her work, has a great sensitivity and awareness of the fragility of human society, how easy it is to fall, to fail, and so forth. And yet, even risking so much and even aware of the stakes for her and for our communities, I was always struck by the fact that I never perceived any fear. Uh, everything was engaged with interest, with courage, with an openness, with a genuine curiosity for what is good. Where did that that capacity to be a lighthouse in the storm come from. You see in her work, and we'll see tonight, that it comes from an understanding, in part, of the role that tradition can play, not in closing one's mind or one reason, but opening it up, using it as the hypothesis to test reality around you, reason and tradition as a dynamic form of knowing rather than a closure of the mind. It came also from her emphasis always, which struck me from the beginning, on reason in particular in practice. It's a juridical mind, a common law juridical mind formed in this environment right here, in fact. Her hero, Carl Llewellyn, emphasizing always the relationship between thought and practice. Phronesis was the form of reasoning that has always been characteristic of her and of what she urged on us as students and on her colleagues in the academy and leaders in the community. And finally, I think what has brought such openness and courage uh, to her has been the unrelenting generosity of spirit towards others, towards her students, towards her interlocutors, even those most in disagreement with her. It's all those things that have allowed her to be at a place like Harvard rather than a place like the University of Chicago. As she uh, commented to us just on the walk over here, this is the greatest university in the United States, she said, where we are now. So, so then, Professor Glendon, why, why are you at Harvard instead of the University of Chicago? And she says, well, some of us are called to be in mission territory. <laughs> in mission territory, so she's been a missionary by it. And of course, she's also been someone whose life has exemplified a combination of thought and reflection and scholarship and practical engagement with the world as ambassador, as diplomatic representative, as someone actively engaged in politics and in the practice of law for many years. One could say that she might be a very suitable, even ideal, candidate for inclusion in, for example, hypothetically, a book devoted to how scholars and politicians have imagined the world. Right. The last chapter could well have been about her and have been an autobiography. But she's given us a biography of others, and we have to be content with understanding that the autobiographical part she has written with the experience of her life and not with her pen. Marianne, welcome and thank you. Well, thank you, Paolo. What a joy it is for a teacher to have a student like Paolo. But I'm afraid that excessively generous introduction, I'm afraid now that I will disappoint you. Uh, but I have to say what a joy it is to be back here at my alma mater, at the greatest university in the world. But it's a very special, peculiar kind of pleasure to be here in Mandel Hall, because it was in Mandel Hall many years ago where the notion, for better or worse, first came into my head that I thought I'd like to go to law school. Well, of course, like 
University of Chicago undergraduates. I was much too young to be making any kind of serious life decision. But I saw a poster that said a law professor named Malcolm Sharp was going to be lecturing in Mandel Hall on Plato's laws. And I was enjoying Plato in Humanities 3, so I toddled over to Mandel Hall. And after I heard Professor Sharp, I thought, wow, law school must be the most wonderful place that has such people in it. Little did I know at the time that that building across the Midway was the Paris Island of American law schools. And little did I know that Professor Sharp was regarded there as something of an eccentric. But I hasten to say it was a fantastic place to get a legal education, even though I never heard any more about Plato over there, even from my contracts teacher, Professor Sharp. So I decided to try to bridge that gap between what happened over here in Humanities 3 and what happened over there in the law school when I became a law professor, and I decided to do so by teaching a course that I called the Foundations of Western legal thought. And of course, number one on my recommended reading list was the famous uh, set of essays by Strauss, uh, edited by Strauss and Cropsey. But as I worked with that book and with the original texts, it seemed to me, and I got feedback from my students, it seemed to me that Strauss and Cropsey, I hope I'm not committing any heresy here, that that book needed to be accompanied by some biographical material about the thinkers they covered and by some more indication of the connection between the protagonists of those essays and the people and political events of their times. And that was the research or the genesis of the research that uh, yielded the book that Paolo just showed you, The Forum and the Tower. But as you know, research has a life of its own and it takes you off into new directions. And one of the most interesting discoveries that I made as I got into the papers of people like Cicero and Edmund Burke was how many prominent figures of the past had struggled with the very same kinds of questions about politics that I hear from my students. As I'm sure you know, many young men and women today go to law school because they think it is the best preparation for public life, for the same reason that Cicero and Edmund Burke and so many others studied law. And over the years, many of my students have gone on to realize their political ambitions. But what has always haunted me are the ones who come to law school with that idea, some of the most principled, intelligent, thoughtful young men and women, just the kind of people you'd like to see in public office, how many of them change their minds by the time they graduate. And when they change their minds, they tell you they do it for reasons like this. Some of them will say, I'm afraid that politics is such a dirty business that I would become contaminated. Uh, some of them say, I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to have a decent family life, or my family couldn't withstand the politics of personal destruction. Here's a big one. Many of them, especially the most thoughtful ones, say, would I have to compromise my principles so much in getting to a position where I could have some influence that I would become a different kind of person and lose sight of the very reasons that I wanted to go into politics for in the first place? And many wonder, if, even if they somehow survived with their principles intact, whether conditions in the world or the country are so bad that they wouldn't be able to make a difference. Now I can tell you after years of sitting on law school admissions committees and reading applications, there is no phrase that you see more often on personal statements than I want to make a difference. And I will say a little bit more about that uh, later on. But the experience of Cicero and Edmund Burke is especially interesting in relation to those kinds of concerns that students have about politics. 
and not least because they are among the very few individuals who have actually been prominent in both of the vocations that Aristotle called the most choice-worthy, politics and philosophy. Of course, as you see, choice-worthy, but not for everybody, he said, choice-worthy, for those who are most ambitious with a view toward virtue, and of course it's understood for those who are capable of them. Uh, as Max Weber wrote in his great essay on politics as a vocation, he said not everybody is capable of politics. The same qualities that make a person a great thinker don't necessarily coincide with those that make the person a great statesperson. Unfortunately, the great Weber did not have enough insight into himself to know that he was not destined to be a politician. He tried all his life to break into politics. But to achieve real eminence in both the Forum and the Tower, as Cicero and Edmund Burke did, is really something like playing in the major leagues in both football and baseball. Not very many people have done it. So one interesting question is, why should two individuals who really did have the choice, why did they opt for politics? There's a variant of that question that uh, one runs into when talking to undergraduates who are deciding whether to go to professional school or to go on to a PhD in the arts and sciences. And I can't tell you how many times colleagues in the arts and sciences have said to me, oh, so-and-so could have been such a great philosopher, but he went to law school instead. Uh, and that was much the kind of thing that uh, Boswell and Johnson said about their friend Edmund Burke. Why did he go into politics? We could have had such a great philosopher. Well, uh, Johnson was right in the sense that Burke could have been. When Burke was still in his 20s, he published two highly regarded books on philosophy. One of them was a little treatise on aesthetics that won favorable acclaim from Diderot and Kant. That's not bad for a kid in his 20s. But Burke himself regarded those works as stepping stones to another career. And what he said about that was, a man who stays in college after having received his education is like a man who builds a ship, rigs it, provisions it, and then never takes it out for a sail. Cicero went a little deeper in explaining why he regarded politics as more choice worthy. In a little book dedicated to his son, he said, no philosophical discourse is so fine that it deserves to be set above the public law and customs of a well-ordered state. Philosophers, he said, can spin theories about justice till the end of their days without ever reaching conclusions. But statesmen are the ones who must actually set conditions to foster the virtues that are necessary to a well-functioning polity. That, he said to his son, that's why the life of public service was always chosen by the best men. Well, of course, implicit in that way of thinking is a certain definition of politics that involves a little bit more than the getting and keeping of power. Implicit, of course, was, again, coming back to Aristotle, the idea of politics as free persons ordering their lives together in the polity. And implicit <coughs> in that is, um, is that statespersons and philosophers have to have some traffic with one another. Um, I'm going to show you a, f a fresco. This is not the fresco. <laughs> oh, well, okay, the fresco comes later, I guess. Um, but I, I'll tell you about it. If you ever go to Siena, 
if you ever go to Siena and to the museum that is the Palazzo Publico, you will see the frescoes of good government in the city and the country and frescoes of bad government in the city and the country. And the idea was that the city fathers of Siena would sit in the Palazzo Publico and wherever they looked, they would see reminders that their actions and decisions had consequences for the welfare of the city. Uh, needless to say, uh, the fact that it's in a museum today uh, tells you something about uh, where that philosophy <laughs> is in present day Siena and perhaps more broadly. But uh, coming back to Rome in Cicero's day, there's serious reason to doubt that uh, what Cicero said about the best people going into politics was true. In Cicero's Rome and the late Roman Republic, as in our own day, uh, many of the most capable people, for what seemed to them very good reasons, were choosing to live a life of comfort and luxury. Some because they were disgusted with public corruption. Some were Epicureans who thought that a wise man does well to stay aloof from political life. And they told Cicero, take a look around the Roman Forum. Why would you want to go into politics? And he gave them a very good answer, which Plato had given before him. Namely, he turned their objection around and said, look, if good people, if brave and wise people don't go into politics, then you leave the city to the weak, the venal, and the wicked. I've often thought that perhaps another factor that nudged people like Cicero and Burke into politics rather than philosophy was that both were very ambitious new men. They were outsiders. They were from the provinces of their respective empires, and they were very eager to make their mark on the larger stage, and they were both pushed by very ambitious fathers to make their mark in national politics or in the politics of the republic, and um, they did so by studying law in Rome and London, respectively. I regret to report that like students with political ambitions today, at least many of them, Cicero and Burke found law school rather boring. They preferred to go to places where they could study the oratorical skills for which both of them later became famous, Cicero to the Forum and Burke to the House of Commons. And just as law students do today, they both started to think about how they wanted to present themselves to the world. Any law students here? Yes, law students. So you're going to know what I'm talking about. So around this time of year, a remarkable metamorphosis takes place in law students. The uh, a young man or woman that you thought you knew and recognized in the first year suddenly looks very different. The clothing, sometimes even the teeth and the noses have changed, and um, sometimes even the name changes. Let's see if I can go back to that. So first year student. Ta-da! job interview. Um, Cicero, his friends told him, if you're going to go into politics, okay, go ahead, but you really have to change your ridiculous name. Because it seems that the name Cicero comes from Kikere, chickpea, and it seems that he got that name because of an ancestor who had a wart like a chickpea on the end of his nose. But Cicero said, I intend to make the name of Cicero famous, more famous than Scourus of the Knobby Ankles and Catullus the Puppy. What did worry him was not his name, but his frail state of health and his liability, believe it or not, to severe attacks of stage fright. As a beginning advocate, he was very successful. He won a lot of cases. But his health, he was plagued with gastrointestinal difficulties. And 
his health deteriorated to the point where his friends and his doctors said, you have got to step down from public life. Well, he didn't want to do it, but it, the situation was so grave that he actually took, I guess what we would call this is something like a gap year, a couple of gap years, and he went off with his friends uh, to Greece and Rhodes where he studied philosophy and rhetoric, and uh, he adopted a very modern sounding uh, regimen. He discovered diet. He got a diet that worked for his tummy. He uh, discovered exercise and massage and after two years he came back to Rome very fit and remained fit and he was with his marriage to a wealthy and well-connected Roman matron he was ready to burst into politics. In Burke's case that problem of how to present myself was much more complicated. Burke wasn't just an outsider from the provinces, he was an Irishman from Dublin and he wanted to break into politics in the country that was then ruling his own country with an iron hand and his question was how much of myself can I afford to reveal? That sort of question also arises for our students these days when they're filling out an application for college or law school or when they're filling out a CV for a job. Uh, many of them worry about whether they should put certain kinds of political activities on their statements. I've noticed recently in law school applications some students will say I worked for a senator without specifying the name or the political affiliation, or I worked for a congressperson. Um, well, Burke's problem, Burke, as you know, in Ireland in his day was ruled under a very harsh system of laws known as the penal laws. They forbade Catholics to practice their religion in public. Uh, they could not exercise the professions. There were limitations on holding property and the barriers to economic advancement were such that many uh, upwardly mobile Catholics converted to the Church of Ireland, the Protestant Church of Ireland, in order to be able to practice law or to do business. If you read a biography of Edmund Burke that was written more than 20 years ago, you almost always see him described as the Protestant son of a Protestant Dublin attorney, which is true as far as it goes, but the reality is much more complicated. Burke's father became a convert to the Church of Ireland, but the mother remained a practicing Catholic. The Burks baptized their sons as Protestants, but their daughter as a Catholic. And when Burke himself married, he married a practicing Catholic like his mother. So you can see why conversion to Protestantism, while it sufficed to open certain doors, uh, didn't quite remove a cloud of suspicion that hung over the converts. In fact, uh, Connor Cruz O'Brien compares the life of people like the Burks in Ireland to that of the Murano Jews in Spain. Children had to be taught to be quite careful from an early age. Now, by the time Burke went to London to study law at the Inns of Court, it was clear that he had a real gift for writing. As I mentioned, he had already written those two well-received books on philosophy. But he also wrote newspaper articles. He found that a man with a way for words would uh, be able to gain a good living in London. And his articles on current events attracted the attention of politicians who were on the lookout for idea people and speech writers. And so at the age of 30, he got his first real political job. He got a job as an assistant to a member of parliament. But imagine his distress when his first assignment in his dream job 
is to prepare a position paper on Ireland for a member of parliament who shared all the usual prejudices of his class and time. So he was immediately faced with a conflict between his desire to affect and improve conditions in his native country, but also to get ahead, to get into a position where he would be able to have some influence in a hostile environment. So what he did in that report was to go as far as he could in criticizing the penal laws, but he added the sentence about the ban on Catholics in public office. He said that ban is just and necessary. Well, we know that's quite different from what he was later to say, and he's been much criticized for it, but he made a little headway, he kept his job, and before long he moved a giant step up the political ladder by becoming the secretary to the Marquis of Rockingham, who was then the head of the Rockingham Whigs and the leader of a coalition government. But the more Burke advanced, the more he ran into what we would today call the politics of personal destruction. In fact, he almost lost his job with Rockingham when Rockingham's friends said, this man is an Irish spy. And even worse than that, he's a secret Catholic. And even worse than that, he's a crypto-Jesuit. Well, you might be wondering what his personal religious views were. And uh, of course, it's very hard to say because Burke destroyed most of his personal papers, his very personal papers, and because no one ever really knows what's in another person's heart. But from all the available evidence, it seems that he was a serious Christian who believed in the doctrines that were shared by the Anglican Church and the church of his own ancestors, and that he really didn't pay much attention or care very much about the differences between them. Nevertheless, rumors about his Catholic connections plagued him throughout his political career. The, uh, his enemies pried into his personal affairs, and the cartoonists never failed to portray him in a Roman collar. And just so, to make sure that everybody remembered that he was Irish, they always showed him eating potatoes with a keg of whiskey nearby. <laughs> now, I think I... But this is the Palazzo Publico that I was looking for, and here are the effects of good government. But, uh, whoops, no, I, I can't find the, can't find the cartoon, too bad. My favorite cartoon shows Burke sitting down and uh, eating those potatoes with three little devils dancing around him. So that there was, that the art of political cartoons was uh, pretty advanced. Now, what I want to come to is the difficult issue, perhaps the most difficult issue, the issue of compromise. When does political compromise shade off into serious moral compromise? How do you know the difference? Both Cicero and Burke had to struggle with that, and they struggled in a way, thankfully, uh, they, they struggled in a way that they reflected upon themselves and left us some of their reflections. Cicero left us about 800 letters, and in those letters, he's constantly wrestling with the difficulty of the fact that the statesperson, unlike the politician, can't deliberate forever. He or she has to act and take responsibility for the actions, has to act often on imperfect information. He liked to say that he sought the highest degree of probability within the range of the possible, aiming for the best, accepting that he must often settle for less. But not surprisingly, he's often been criticized for what today we would call flip-flopping. And that's not an easy question, is it? When does, should you regard a person's change of mind as simple expediency, and when does a person's change of mind reflect a praiseworthy willingness to take into consideration 
new information or a better understanding. Not surprisingly, Cicero bridled at what he thought were unfair charges of flip-flopping and inconsistency. On one occasion, he wrote to the person who attacked him, he said, at sea, it's good sailing to run before the gale, even if the ship can't make harbor. But if she can make harbor by changing tack, only a fool would risk shipwreck by holding the original course. Cicero's career saw many changes of tack. And some people, like Winston Churchill, thought he was a model of political prudence. Others thought he was expedient, cowardly, hypocritical. Uh, if you see the HBO Rome series, you'll see Cicero is not a very admirable fellow. But by his own account, there were many times when he didn't live up to his own standards, and he often berated himself for failing to live up to his own ideals. The most famous example of that occurred when he was in the highest position that he ever held, that of co-counsel of Rome, and in the course of putting down the Catiline conspiracy, he sentenced five co-conspirators to death without trial. Now, he could and did try to justify that by saying it was an emergency measure. Sounds very modern, doesn't it? Emergency measure approved by the Senate, but it did violate one of the central principles of the very Roman laws that he was often at pains to defend. But on the other hand, there were times when he paid a very high price for refusing to compromise his principles. For example, when Caesar and Crassus and Pompey invited him to join their triumvirate, he declined because he could see that the way they were reducing the powers of the Senate and the tribunes was destructive of the Republic. But later on, the triumvirs refused to support him when the friends of Catiline obtained passage of a law specifically directed at Cicero, sentencing to death or exile anyone who was responsible for the execution of a Roman citizen without a trial. So Cicero had to pack up and leave uh, for a number of years. His home on the Palatine Hill was destroyed. All his property was confiscated. Eventually he was pardoned, came back to Rome, took his seat in the Senate, but then he had to face another difficult choice. What to do in the bitter rivalry between Octavian and Antony? He didn't think either one held out much prospect for the good of the Republic, but he gambled on, on Octavian, figuring that perhaps his youth argued in favor of some malleability. What he couldn't foresee was that Octavian and Antony patched up their differences, and Antony, furious at the speeches that Cicero had given against him, ordered that he should be killed. Octavian, fair-weather friend, stood by, and uh, Cicero was hunted down. And uh, when he saw that he couldn't escape, he faced his captors and offered his neck to the sword so that he could die like a Roman citizen. Antony wasn't satisfied with uh, merely killing Cicero. He ordered that Cicero's head and the hands that had written the speeches against Antony be nailed up in the forum for everyone to see. It seems that Octavian Many years later, as Caesar Augustus finally felt some shame about his acquiescence in that whole affair, uh, the story, as Plutarch tells it, is that Anthean came, an, an, that Octavian came upon his little grandson one day, and the grandson was reading a book by Cicero, and he hid it under his toga because he didn't want his grandfather to see it. And Octavian took the book and looked at it for a while, and he gave it back to the boy, and he said, Son, this was a learned man, a learned man and a lover of his country. Well, Burke never rose so high in politics as Cicero did, nor did he fall so calamitously. But he, too, frequently had to struggle with the problem of how far to compromise without 
marginalizing himself or how to advance his causes without marginalizing himself. And he had five great causes. W.B. Yeats referred to those causes as all linked by what he called Burke's great melody, a deep aversion to the abuse of power. He took the side of the American colonists in their claim to have the rights of Englishmen. He took up the cause of the oppressed Catholics in Ireland. He took up the cause of the peoples of India against the British East India Tea Company. He spotted early that the French Revolution was going to descend into terror, took a very unpopular stand on that, and he defended British parliamentary rule against royal prerogative. And as you can expect with somebody who embraced so many unpopular causes, some people regarded him as sacrificing too much uh, to expediency along the way. Uh, here's what Connor Cruz O'Brien said. While Burke generally argued from deep and strong conviction, he was not above the occasional strategic adjustment if it might serve to carry the rest of his argument. So you might want to know how far Burke was willing to go in making a strategic adjustment. Here's what Burke himself said. Falsehood and, delusion, falsehood and delusion are allowed in no case whatsoever. But as in the exercise of all the virtues, there is an economy of truth. It is a sort of temperance by which a man speaks truth with measure that he may speak it the longer. Well, that didn't sit well with Burke's friend, Dr. Samuel Johnson, who was more known for blurting out the truth on occasions when it might have been better just to keep his mouth shut. Uh, but what Johnson said, according to Boswell, is, I do not say that Burke is dishonest, but neither can I say that he is always honest. So opinions differed, but what is beyond dispute is that when Burke finally did get into a position where he could wield some influence, he did not hesitate to put his career on the line, not once, but three times for the sake of principle. And each time he suffered serious political loss. The first occasion occurred when he was serving as member of parliament for the Bristol, for the city of Bristol, I think everybody at the University of Chicago has read the famous speech where Burke said that while he owed a duty of loyalty to his constituents, he owed them his own independent judgment. Oh, there is Burke with the little devils under the table. He said, that's, that's my favorite cartoon. That's got everything in it. it he's, he's eating potatoes, and he's got a keg of whiskey with a particularly unattractive crucifix and the, and the little devils dancing around underneath. Uh, so the speech that he gave to the electors at Bristol, probably um, the most important position he ever held was uh, representing Bristol. But uh, the fact that he took that position with regard to representation uh, meant that his position uh, was short-lived. He antagonized the Bristol electors by advocating free trade with Ireland and then antagonized them further by working for, successfully working for, the first ever reform, modest reform, of the penal laws. But wouldn't you know it, uh, the very people who benefited from his uh, successful attempt to get the penal laws modified criticized him for not having done enough and not having gone the whole hog. In any event, uh, he was, uh, his party refused to run him again for Bristol, and they didn't want to lose their best orator, so they ran him instead from a little pocket borough called Malton. And in that place, he took up another unpopular cause, which was a crusade against the British 
East India Tea Company, which he had discovered that the company headed by Warren Hastings, the Governor General of Bengal, was presiding over a vast system of torture and abuse, what today we would call serious human rights violations. And he persuaded the House of Commons to bring a bill of impeachment against Hastings with Burke himself as prosecutor. Well, he lost the case, but the prosecution was not in vain. In fact, Burke was one of the first lawyers to understand that in a high-profile case, a litigation strategy has to be accompanied by a public relations strategy. And even though he did lose, what he did was make the British public aware of the atrocities that were being committed in their name, and eventually he set in motion the forces that eventually put an end to the corrupt system that had prevailed under Hastings. The third time Burke put his career on the line was, of course, in connection with his then unpopular stand on the French Revolution. It led to such a bitter dispute with his party leader, Charles James Fox, that Burke retired from politics and spent his few remaining years writing the work that has become the classic reflections on the revolution in France. Now, now that I'm nearing the end of this talk, what I'd like to draw from just these few suggestive stories about Cicero and Burke are a few observations about the careers of those two in relation to this idea of making a difference. The first interesting thing is that neither Burke nor Cicero, brilliant as they were, seems to have seen very deeply into their own vocations. Both of them opted for politics over philosophy. Uh, both of them were quite outspoken about why they opted for politics over philosophy. And yet, both of them are remembered today chiefly for their political theory. Another interesting thing is that if either man reflected at the end of his life about the success or the results of their efforts to advance the causes that were closest to their hearts, both of them must have thought that they were failures. The Roman Republic did perish. England did lose the colonies. The people of Ireland and India remained oppressed for a very long time. France was convulsed with terror in 1793 and headed for decades of political instability. Yet, if you take the longer view here, I think the message is that just because one does not see the results of one's decisions and actions in one's own lifetime doesn't mean that they were in vain. In fact, both Cicero and Burke did make a difference, but neither could have imagined the kinds of difference their efforts would make in years to come. So to give just one example, Cicero, in his wildest dreams, could not have imagined that the effect that he would have many years after his death on a 19-year-old pagan boy in North Africa. Here's how St. Augustine described his encounter with philosophy in a book by, as he said, a certain Cicero. That book of his contains an exhortation to study philosophy. This book indeed changed my whole way of feeling. It changed my prayers, Lord, to be towards you yourself. It gave me different plans and desires. Suddenly all vain aspirations lost their value. I was left with an unbelievable fire in my heart, desiring the deathless qualities of wisdom. I began to rise up to return to you. So with regard to the question, will I make a difference, I think one thing we learned from Cicero and Burke that that's probably the wrong question because every one of us will make a difference whether we mean to or not. With every breath you take, with every move you make as the song goes, you are constituting yourself as a certain kind of person. And with every thought, decision, and action, we are shifting probabilities one way or the other. So the question 
really is not whether we make a difference, but what kind of person we become and what kind of difference we make. Now, finally, I have to come back to whether law school is a good preparation for politics. And I want to conclude by paying homage to my old teacher, Malcolm Sharp, by recalling Plato's advice that law and politics and philosophy all suffer if they become separated from one another. So here's what Plato said in the Theotetus or has Socrates say, the man who has knocked about all his life in the law courts acquires a tense and bitter shrewdness, but his mind is narrow and crooked. He passes from youth to manhood with no soundness in him and turns out in the end a man of formidable intellect in his own imagination. But at the same time, Socrates is very severe with philosophers. He says, you have to pay attention to law and politics, not only out of civic duty, but to make sure that you stay grounded in reality and to make sure that conditions will continue to exist for the life of philosophy. So that openness to cross-disciplinary fertilization that bridge across the midway, if I could put it that way. That's very much the spirit that I associate with the University of Chicago, and I'm so glad to have this occasion to express my gratitude for the education I received here, and to all of you for coming tonight. Thank you.